welcome back to the Godly Playroom. I hope you had a wonderful week. Let's go ahead and change our calendar. As you can see, we're now in the time of Pentecost. But last week it was said, the first week of Pentecost. And now that we're on the second week of Pentecost, we're back in the time, oh. We're back in the time of green. Okay. Now today's story is going to be a long one, but I think you'll enjoy it nonetheless. So our story actually begins with a baby being born, and the parents of this baby decided to name him Saul after the first king of Israel. Now Saul grew up in a place called Tarsus, which is close to the sea. Growing up, Saul also helped his father in his workshop, who was a tent maker. Now, even though they lived far away from Rome and they were Jewish, they were still considered Roman citizens like others were at the time. Maybe this had something to do with Saul's father making tents for the Roman army. Also growing up, Saul learned many languages in the streets of Tarsus, but his favorite one by far was the language of the synagogues. Saul and his father would study the Torah together, which is the Hebrew Bible. Now, Saul was very serious about getting to know the ways of the Torah. And when he got older, he decided to go to Jerusalem to find the best teachers for his studies. And as you can see here, there he is. He's an adult. He's grown up and he's saying goodbye to Tarsus and he's going on his way to the Holy City. So. He arrived in the city, and the first thing he did is that he went to the temple, and it was at the temple he began to worship. This is also likely the place that he studied and worked. As you can see, here he is at the temple, and there's Saul, and that's his teacher. His teacher was named Gamaliel, but it's also possible that it was one of Gamaliel's family members. Saul wanted to become a Pharisee, and Pharisees are very serious about making sure that the laws of the Torah are being followed. And Saul was serious about this. He did not have time or patience for anyone who did not listen to the Torah. One day, Saul heard about these. They called themselves the followers of the way, and these people thought that the Messiah had come, and that the Messiah was Jesus of Nazareth. But this actually made Saul angry. For one, the Messiah was supposed to drive the soldiers out of Rome and rule the land with peace and justice. But Jesus was a criminal. And on top of that, it was written that God punished anyone who was, quote unquote, hung on a tree. So these people were spreading lies about God and Saul wanted to fix that. One of the most important followers of the way was someone named Stephen. Now Stephen was put on trial in the temple, but then they took him outside of the city and they stoned him to death. They threw rocks at him until it eventually killed him. And Saul, well, he held on to everyone's coats as they were throwing rocks at Stephen. One day though, Saul got a letter from the high priest telling him to go to a place called Damascus. And in Damascus, he was to find more followers of the way and take them back to Jerusalem to be punished. And so he went along his way that afternoon on the road to Damascus. But along the way, there was a great bright light. And it was so bright and blinding that it blinded Saul and he fell to the ground. As you can see here, he's on the ground and now he can't see a thing. But in the chaos of his darkness, Saul heard a voice, and the voice said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you hurting me? And Saul said, Lord, who are you? And the voice said, I am Jesus, and you are hurting me. Get up and go to the city. There you'll be told what to do. So Saul tried to get up and 
go to the city, but he was still blind. He was eventually led to a house on Spring Street of the city, and for three days, Saul did not have anything to eat or drink. But then one day, a voice came to Saul again, and this voice said, Hello, Brother Saul. My name is Ananias, and I am here. I was sent by Jesus to lay hands on you and bless you. And when Ananias laid his hands on Saul, it was as if fish scales had fallen off of Saul's eyes and he could see again. And when Ananias baptized Saul, well, he was a changed man. It was as if the Holy Spirit was just running through his body. And then they ate together that night. Saul was so weak from going days without anything to eat or drink. Oh, we actually put this here. But slowly he regained his strength, and once he was better, he was still excited about what happened to him, and he went to the, he went to the synagogue to tell his friends about what happened. But when the Jewish people heard his story, they tried to kill him, and they even sent guards to the gates of the city to catch Saul if he tried to escape. But luckily, some of the followers of the way hid Saul within the city so that they could not find him. One night, they went to the walls of the city. Here they are at the walls of the city, and as you can see, they have a rope and a large basket, and they actually use this to lower Saul down to the other side of the wall, outside of the city, and then into the desert, he disappeared. In the desert, Saul was confused. He needed to understand what God wanted him to do. Saul was originally sent to Damascus to catch followers of the way, but now he was one of them. What could any of this mean? Saul began to pray to God, and as he prayed to God, he looked out into the darkness of the desert and listened. It was quiet. And Saul came so close to God, as God came so close to Saul. And that was when Saul knew when, what he had to do. His mission was to go to the edges of the earth and tell his story. He was to show how his hatred turned into love, and he was to build churches to do this. He was to also write letters to younger churches as well to teach them how to do this. And so, Saul began to do his work. He traveled along many lands and crossed oceans and told his story. He returned to Jerusalem and met with Peter and James and some of the other followers, but now they were called Christians. You can see here's Saul doing his work. Also, Saul at this point had changed his name. You see, he was going along the Roman Empire so much that he was often using the Roman version of his name, which was Paul. As I mentioned, Part of Paul's work was to build new churches to tell his story, as well as write letters to younger churches to help them. He wrote to many churches. He wrote, he wrote to the Philippians, to the Corinthians, the Ephesians, the Thessalonians. He even wrote to the Romans, telling them that he was hoping to one day visit them in Spain. But Paul knew that he had to go back to Jerusalem one last time. He went to the temple and knew he had to make a sacrifice. You see, Paul was still considered a Nazarite, which is someone who strictly follows the Jewish law. But he was also a Christian now. And as you can see, when he entered the city, the people started pushing him around and shouting, you don't belong here. The soldiers actually had to get involved and ward off the people with their swords and their shields. They dragged Paul to the fortress Antonia, and they started to beat him in order to get him to confess why the people were attacking him. It was here that Paul told them that he was a Roman citizen, and because of that, he had to be put on trial in a Roman court. He was sent to a place called Caesarea. But then about two years later, he was put on a ship, and the ship was heading to Rome. And in Rome, he would 
be judged in a court of law there. Along the way, his ship sank, but thankfully he was saved and was able to continue on his way. Paul was put on house arrest, which meant he could not leave his home. He had a guard watching him, but he was able to still visit with friends while waiting for the judges to decide what he did wrong. Some say that Paul was able to eventually go to Spain and then return to Rome. Some say that he was executed shortly after the year 67 when Rome was burnt down. I, for a, I however, like to think that Paul is still out there somewhere telling his story to the, going to the edges of the earth. But you see, Paul told his story many, many times and wrote many letters in the process. He himself has become a story, and to this day, here's all his letters, and they're still being read in the church. Here they are. Now, I wonder, what is your favorite part of his story? Now, I wonder, what, where do you see yourself in the story? What do you think is the most important part of the story? Now I wonder, what part of the story could we leave out and still have everything we need? All right, let's put this away. So we have the letters. Then from start to end of the story, we have Paul le Saul leaving Tarsus, Saul studying at the temple, Saul getting blinded along the road to Damascus, Saul escaping Damascus. Saul telling his story and changing his name to Paul. Paul getting attacked at the temple. And then Paul's death. So we tell this story, it's going to be in the godly playroom. But let's go ahead and gather our stuff so we can read scriptures and say our prayers. Jesus is always with us. But when we say our prayers, it feels like he's especially close, close to us. Oh no. We can't use that one. Oh, there's only a few left in here. But I think we have enough to fight for today. Now today's scriptures, first of all, take a look at this um this bookmark. It's the entire story from today, isn't it? King Agrippa, after I heard this vision from heaven, I obeyed it. I began telling people that they should change their hearts and lives and turn to God. I told them to do things to show that they had really changed. I told this first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and in every part of Judah, and also to the non-Jewish people. This is why the Jews took me and were trying to kill me in the temple. But God helped me and is still helping me today. With God's help, I am standing here today and telling all people what I have seen. But I am saying nothing new. I am saying what Moses and the prophets said would happen. They said the Christ would die and be the first to rise from death. They said that the Christ would bring light to the Jewish and non-Jewish people. All right, and let's go ahead and say our prayers. You can 
say them to yourself or out loud, God will understand either way. But if you have people around you, and if when you're back in the Gothic playroom, they may not know when you're done. So when you say amen, you pass the when, when you're done, you say amen and you pass the baby Jesus along. I'll go ahead and give you a few seconds to pray. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us to tell today's story and for showing us how even with our hatred and bad things that we do, that we can still change and become good people. We ask that you be with those who are suffering or need change in their lives for the better. And we ask that you also be with the children and keep them safe with the things going on in their lives and in the world. And that things will change for the better. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let's go ahead and let's change the light of the Christ candle because when we see it here, it just reminds us of when Jesus was still on earth, but could only be one place at a time. But what happens when we change it? It reminds us of when he died. But look at the smoke. He arose up into heaven and now he can be everywhere at all times. Now, this is actually going to be our last lesson for quite some time. We're having our classroom redone, but when we come back to the Godly Playroom, things are going to be very different. Until then, I thank you so much for joining us for these story times, and I hope that you have a safe and wonderful week. Bye!